Okay, in this lecture I'm going to be talking about um, relationships between free energy, chemical potential, and um, phase transitions. In particular we're going to be talking about nucleation, which is the first steps in, uh, of how a phase transition begins, the initial step where a little bit of one phase starts turning into the other phase. Okay, so um, in the beginning parts of the lecture I'm going to um, discuss and remind you about chemical potential and what this means. So this is given the symbol mu. So we're going to be talking about nucleation and phase transitions in the context of chemical potential. Um, and we're going to relate chemical potential to the Gibbs free energy. So the relationship between mu and g, which is uh, Gibbs free energy. And then finally, in the last bit of the lecture, we're going to be talking about how uh, these two properties can be used to understand how phase transitions begin. That is the process called nucleation. Okay, so to start with, let's recall some basic facts about uh, basic facts about mu chemical potential. Okay, so one of the first things, uh, sort of the most intuitive and basic idea you could have about mu with chemical potential is that it reflects the tendency for a system to want to give up particles. So if a system, if one system has a higher mu than another, then it wants to give up particles to the other system. So this is a tendency to give up particles. So that is, if mu1 is bigger than mu2, then uh, system system one wants to give up uh, gives up particles to system two that is particles move from system one to system two okay so and likewise I think I um, in a previous lecture, we mentioned that if the two systems have equal chemical potential, then they are in what we refer to as diffusive equilibrium. So there is no tendency for particles to diffuse. So this, this process of one system giving up particles to the other system is, uh, occurs by diffusion, usually, in the, in the context that we're talking about here. So um, if you, two systems have equal chemical potential, then we say that they are at diffusive equilibrium. Okay, so that's just a basic intuitive idea for what mu means. Um, another thing that we mentioned previously is that high concentration or higher concentration means higher mu, which um, should be clear when you think about this, this intuitive um, idea is about mu and the tendency to give up particles. If one system has a much higher concentration of a particular type of particle than another, then it will have a higher mu. So higher concentration um, corresponds to higher, higher chemical potential. Okay. Um, but although we should make a, a little note here, since we're talking about phase transitions, this is not always true. So for instance, if, you, if there are phase changes um, going on, you can have very high concentration in, let's say, the liquid phase compared to a gas phase, uh, but the liquid phase nonetheless could have, um, um, as we'll see, a lower mu. Okay, so make a note here that this is um, assuming no phase changes. Okay, 
Now, uh, what we're going to start getting into now are sort of slightly less um, intuitive ways to look at mu based on uh, thermodynamic identities, um, either for energy U or for uh, the Gibbs free energy G. So first, uh, the less useful one, I just want to sort of get you warmed up for how we're going to think about using a thermodynamic identity to get some information about mu. Let's first take a look at um, the thermodynamic identity for U. So the thermodynamic identity uh, for the total energy U. Right now, you remember from previous lectures that this is this is um, the thermodynamic identity for U. Now, you could use this in a number of ways to 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 learn something about the meaning of mu. For instance, if you were to say um, for for fixed volume. Um, and fixed energy, which is a slightly difficult situation to imagine, but that, that's a possible thing that can happen. In that case, then this term is zero, the PdV term is zero because fixed V, and the DU term is zero because of fixed U. So in that case, um, you have that mu equals um, minus T dS dN. Right, I just set this to zero and this to zero and solved for mu. So this would say that in this particularly odd scenario here, if you fix the volume and you fix the total energy of the system and you start changing the number of particles in the system and you see how the entropy changes, that's directly related to mu, also depending on temperature. Likewise, you could, you could also consider a scenario um, where somehow the energy was fixed and the entropy was fixed and you can get a relationship for how uh, mu depends on uh, changes in volume with changes in particles. Okay, but these are not, this particular relationship I don't, is not going to be what we're going to be using today. What we're going to think about today instead is um, a relationship that we get from the thermodynamic identity for Gibbs free energy. So let's Let's work on that one for a moment. And I just want to remind you as well that this, this statement here, this thermodynamic identity, is true no matter what. The one that's in the box here is true for no matter what situation you're considering. That's why we call it an identity. It's almost... Um, it's fundamentally, it's true. It's based on the definitions of the properties uh, in the equation. It's not dependent on what's being held fixed. What you learn from this, like in this case, if we held uh, V and U fixed, then we learn something from this. But this equation in the box is generally true. Similarly, we can come up with a generally true statement for um, a thermodynamic identity for G. Remember, G is defined as U minus TS plus PV. So um, if you consider some small change in G, so what I'm going to do first here is actually derive this thermodynamic identity for G. So this is, you could consider some change um, in each one of these five quantities, the U, T, S, P, and V. So you could have a change due to DU, you could have a change due to, uh, oops, due to change in entropy or change in temperature. So that's a product rule applied to this product here. And similarly, the volume could change or the pressure could change. Okay, and now to make this expression a bit simpler and more useful, what we'll do is, is substitute in this expression for du right here for this du. So then we have, so I'm substituting all of this in for the du here. So this is TdS minus P dV plus mu dN. 
that's the du, right? Now the rest of it, minus t ds minus s dt plus p. EV plus VDP. Okay, so you can see now that we have some cancellation. This guy cancels with that. And the minus PDV here cancels with the plus PDV there. So the general thermodynamic, thermodynamic identity for G is minus S DT plus VDP plus mu dN. So this statement in this box is what we would call the thermodynamic identity for G, and it is generally true no matter what's being held fixed. Now, but similarly to what we did here, we can learn something useful from it if we do consider a situation where certain quantities are held fixed. In particular, um, a very useful situation to consider is when temperature and pressure are held fixed. So dt and dp are zero. So for fixed t and p, you know, that means that dt equals zero and dp equals zero. In that case, then dg is just equal to, so this term is zero, this term is zero, is just equal to mu dn. Right, this fixed t, fixed p situation is more useful because it's, it's more commonly uh, something we can uh, have in a scenario that we have in the lab. You know, you, you have, you're doing some situation where you're changing the state or changing, having a phase transition that happens at constant p at atmospheric pressure and at some fixed temperature that you're controlling um, in the lab, for instance. Okay, so this expression is true. Now, we can go a bit further with it as well. So um, if, you, if you consider these changes as being small enough, and then we can rewrite this. Um, well, actually, no. So let's just now consider if you take both sides of this equation and integrate, then, um, and if you consider this, uh, well, if mu does not depend on the change in the number of particles, then this is just mu times n plus some constant and the left side is just G, where you're considering um, limits of the integral that go from zero to some, so zero to G, and zero to N. So if mu is independent of N, then we have this, this uh, uh, simple relationship, and this constant, in fact, has to be zero if mu is independent of N, because G equals zero, and uh, for G equals zero, N equals zero other way around. If, if there's no particles, there's no free energy, right? So if n is 0, then g must be equal to 0. Therefore, this constant has to be 0. OK, so this step here is um, if mu is independent of n, which is true in a lot of situations, but um, it's not true in certain situations, for instance, if the, vo if the volume is held fixed. That is, if you start changing the number of particles that a system has, say you start adding particles to the system, but you don't allow the particle's volume to change, then the density of particles is going up, and the concentration is going up, so mu is probably going up, um, right? But in, if the volume is allowed to expand as you're adding particles, then you can keep mu fixed. So that's what happens in this situation of constant pressure and constant temperature. The volume grows in just the right amount to keep mu fixed, so that this is a true statement as you go from here to here. Okay, so this, if you solve for mu now, 
gives us a, a new and somewhat useful uh, interpretation for uh, the chemical potential. That is, in the situation, so this is again, remember, this is for fixed P and temperature. In that situation, you can think of the mu as the free energy per particle. So if you figure out exactly the total free energy divided by the number of particles, that's mu in the situation for fixed P and T. OK, so that's what I wanted to introduce today for uh, sort of something new about the chemical potential and how it's related to the Gibbs free energy. Now we're going to use this as we go forward to um, uh, think about phase transitions from a slightly different perspective than what we have in previous lectures. OK, so keep this fact in mind now. As we go forward. So in, in previous lectures, I've shown you that um, a fundamental way to understand why a phase transition occurs is that um, the free energy of one phase becomes uh, lower than the free energy of another phase. So a phase, so you could write it in this way: phase transition, a phase transition from phase A to phase B. You know, this could be gas and this could be liquid, for instance. Um, starts, it starts to happen. under conditions that uh, result in the free energy of phase B is less than the free energy of phase A. All right, so if some change is happening that results in a, uh, a, decrease, so a decrease in the free energy of phase B such that it finally goes lower than the free energy of phase A, then the phase transition starts to happen because the system is always trying to reach the uh, lowest free energy. OK. So and, and again, this scenario where we uh, understand phase transitions in terms of free energy makes sense when you're talking about fixed P and fixed T conditions. So this the same scenario we're talking about here. And so we can think of this in another way, which is that um, as soon as Also, we could think of this as soon as when um, the chemical potential of phase B drops below the chemical potential of phase A. Right? So um, this is assuming that they had equal numbers of particles. OK, so maybe assuming Na equals Nb, for instance. But this, this idea, though, is, is interesting. It's one way to think about a phase transition is that uh, if you think about the two phases, the gas phase and the liquid phase, for example, as two systems, then you can think of the phase transition as is starting to occur when one phase wants to give up particles to the other phase. So for instance, if, gas, if the gas phase is phase A and the liquid phase is phase B, and then the liquid phase somehow comes to a lower free energy than the gas phase, then the liquid phase wants to take particles away from the gas phase. That is, it wants to um, start turning this system from uh, gas to a liquid. So in, in, a, in an interesting way, you could think of this as uh, the phase transition occurs because the two phases are no longer in diffusive equilibrium. That is, their, their chemical potentials are not equal.
Okay, so that's that's one way we can think about phase transitions in terms of the chemical potential. Now let's let's use these as we go further and talk about um, a nucleation process. Okay. All right. So nucleation, nucleation. Um, like I said before, is just it's the beginning steps of a phase transition, right? You could think of nucleation of water droplets in the formation of a cloud, for instance. Um, this happens when that water vapor starts making a phase transition to liquid water and little droplets start to form. That initial step where the, the formation of the liquid droplets happens is a nucleation process, right? These, uh, the, the phase transition starts at particular locations and often that those particular locations are, are triggered or nucleated on impurities in the system. For instance, cloud formation has a lot to do with um, dust particles in the atmosphere. So little bits of things in the atmosphere nucleate the phase transition from water vapor to water droplets uh, to liquid water. Okay, so we could think of this, and most of the example I'm going to be talking about, uh, okay, so let's think about the example of H2O vapor to uh, liquid water. And an example would be cloud formation. This is example is in also in problem 5.46 in the book. Okay, so um, we could also think about this in a slightly more controlled system. So in, in previous lectures as well, we've talked about um, a situation where you have inside of some container with controlled pressure, you have a balloon that so here's a balloon that is at fixed pressure and temperature with uh, some environment that it's in, okay? So the, the P and T inside the balloon is equal to the P and T outside the balloon. And what we're imagining is that um, we start with a balloon filled with water vapor. So initially, uh, the balloon is filled with water vapor. And then uh, the scenario you can imagine is that at fixed temperature we'll gradually increase the pressure until um, water, this water vapor starts to turn into uh, liquid water. So you can imagine a little droplet starting to form somewhere inside this balloon. So this is a droplet of liquid. Okay, so we increase P at fixed T slowly slowly enough that we can consider um, at any given moment that the system has fixed P and T. But, okay, so increase P at fixed T slowly uh, until this droplet starts to form, until the phase transition starts. Okay. So, and let's see, so maybe you can add a little bit of detail to this picture. If this is some kind of container that, um, where we have control over the pressure, uh, yeah, you could have some kind of a pressure control system that, so this is the pressure gauge. So just imagine that you have some control over the pressure of this outside uh, environment in which the balloon is sitting, and that you have some control over the temperature as well. Okay, fine. 
All right. So now, before the phase transition starts, so let, let's first consider this. So before the phase transition starts. In that situation, the free energy can be thought of as mu g times n, where mu g is the chemical potential of water vapor at temperature T and pressure P. Okay, so this mu g is um, the g refers to gas. So chem this is the chemical potential of the H two O vapor. And n is the number of molecules in the system. Okay? Now, when the first droplet starts to form, then the total um, free energy is then a sum of two terms. So this, again, mu g is the chemical potential for H2O vapor at this temperature. This is the number of gas particles. This is the number of liquid particles. And this is the chemical potential for liquid water at the same temperature. Same conditions we're talking about here. Now, where the total number of particles has to equal the sum of these uh, the number in the gas phase and the number in the liquid phase. Okay, so if, if that's if we know this and we know that, then we can write this a little more simply, or a, or a little differently, I should say. Let's write mu g as n minus n l. That's just replacing this n g with n minus n l, and. Um, we can rearrange this a little bit so that we can see this as um, a difference in chemical potential between the two phases. Here, times the number of liquid droplets times uh, added to mu g times n. Okay, so let's go a bit further here and say that the droplet of liquid here, um, so let's say the first droplet, well, let's consider that it has some particular radius. Let's consider that it's a sphere, which we'll come back to in a moment later, but let's say the first droplet has a radius r, and it's a spherical thing, then uh, we can write this number of liquid molecules in terms of this radius in the following way. So, um, so this is another fact we can write down. The number of liquid molecules equals, um, bit, well, let's write it in words first, volume of the, the droplet divided by um, the volume of one water molecule volume per molecule. And so this is going to be, let's write this as volume of droplet per, I'm going to write a little script V for volume per molecule. So volume per molecule, we're going to assume, it, well, it is some property of the particular types of molecule we're talking about. In this example, we're talking about water, but this would be a different number for some other type of phase transition, some other type of molecule. So for 4 thirds pi r cubed, that's the volume of the drop, divided by this little script V is our number of liquid molecules. OK, let's keep going. I'm going to make some space over here. So then the total free energy can be written as mu g times n um, plus this 
mu L minus mu G times this four thirds pi r cubed over little v. Now, at this point, um, you would think I'm done, but at this, up to this point, we have neglected one other important term that I'm going to introduce right now. Okay, so um, so this term, strictly speaking, was not quite right yet. Okay, so what we needed here, um, and I'm going to write this down. G boundary. So G boundary is something that we neglected over here. So let's, if you have room in your page, go back here and write it down now. So G boundary needs to be added in all of these cases as well. Oops. And this one. Okay, so what is G boundary? So we left this out uh, because it doesn't, uh, yeah, it was neglected in this point of view. What it is um, and what we were neglecting before is that it in fact requires additional free energy to create a surface between two phases. So um, you've heard of surface tension. This is directly related to surface tension. So. In fact, there is a, so where G boundary is equal to, or maybe defined by, um, surface tension sigma times the surface area. So this is um, the surface, so sigma is surface tension and A is the surface area. In this case we're talking about the droplet. So this is a material property. Surface tension is a material property. You can look up values um, of surface tension for water at given temperatures and things like that. So this is a material property this is, of course, de determined by the volume of the droplet or the, the radius of the droplet. Um, but just keep in mind that uh, this is a empirical law here. So um, in, in a sense, it's a definition. That is, y if you try to account for the free energy in a water droplet, you would be wrong unless you also accounted for this term as well which can be determined empirically. So, um, so G boundary is equal to sigma times A, and sigma, um, we'll keep that as a constant that's just a material property, and the surface area is then 4 pi r squared. Okay. So we're getting there. Where are we getting, you might ask? Where we're getting to is um, an expression for how the free energy depends on the radius of a droplet. Okay, so what I'm eventually going to show you here is um, something interesting about how these phase transitions start and how they must get over a sort of, because of this term that we had been neglecting until now, they have to sort of get over a barrier. Uh, there's a little bit of a hurdle to starting the phase transition, okay, which is giving us a more accurate view of how these phase transitions actually start. Okay, so let's let's rewrite this one more time here. So um, the the total mu or the total uh, free energy is is mu g times n. This is a constant for the system plus um, mu l minus mu g times 4 pi over 3 little v times 
r cubed, and then the g boundary term is a plus sigma 4 pi r squared. Okay, now what I want to point out here, so this is, this is telling us basically how does g depend on r. Everything in this equation is, an, is a constant. Uh, let's see, so this is a constant. Let's call that C1. C1. This is a constant. Let's call that C2. And this is a constant, C3. Now, note that C2 is negative. Right, we're talking about a phase transition from a gas to a liquid. So mu L is less than mu G. So this mu L minus mu G is a negative quantity here. So this guy is negative. This one's positive. Surface tension is a positive quantity. 4 pi is positive. This one's positive. Um, this one's also positive, but it's, and it's just, um, Okay, this one's positive. Okay, so just let's take a moment to think about this. We have, um, just rewriting this thing a little bit to make it a little more obvious, this is a constant. Um, and, and I'm gonna write this, let's, let's write this in this way actually. So, um, so let's define this as minus C1. So we're gonna say, right here, plus. Okay, fine plus C3 R squared minus C2 R cubed, okay? So G is a function of R is this polynomial uh, dependence on R like this. Let's, let's think about how does G depend on R, okay? So there's the first, it's got, for, for R equals zero, you, it's at C1. And as R grows, um, initially, for sufficiently small R, this term will always be bigger than this term. That is, if R is really, really small, so much smaller than one, this term will be significantly smaller than this one. So the initial, uh, let's draw a dotted line here to represent uh, C1. So initially, you have a positive quadratic growth for small R. So this thing is growing quadratically with R. And then for large enough R, this term becomes dominant and, and it's negative, right? So you have eventually, for large enough R, this thing has to turn over and start dropping like minus R cubed. So you get some kind of, so over here you have something that's going like minus R cubed and up over here you've got something that's rising like positive R squared. So this is how the free energy of this droplet depends on the droplet size. Let's think about what this means, actually. So that is, even though the, uh, the chemical potential of the liquid is smaller than that of the gas, and the phase transition, in some sense, wants to happen because of that, it can't easily happen because of this little hump here. In other words, in order for it to actually happen, remember, the free energy has to decrease. So it has to get over this hump, past this point, at which point, well, once it gets past here, then the, ph the phase transition will happen because it can, it's free to increase its radius. That is, the droplet is turning more, it's getting bigger and bigger, turning more and more gas to liquid. And by doing so, the free energy drops and drops. But initially, it has to get over this little hump that is caused by the surface tension contribution, right? This G boundary term is the one that, um, has the C3 that's positive that causes this increase in G as a function of R. So the surface tension term, the boundary term, uh, imposes a certain barrier, energy barrier, over which this droplet has to get before uh, the phase transition can really take off and, and go all the way to liquid from a gas. So that's, uh, that's one point that I wanted to make, that is, 
if you really start thinking carefully about how a phase transition happens and you account for this, this surface tension, um, it's not just going to happen immediately as soon as the uh, free energy is of the liquid phase is lower than the gas phase, but it has to be, it has to get over this little hump to do so. And one way that it can get over this hump um, is that is by having some help from an impurity in the system. This is where the nucleation comes into play. So um, let's think about that for a moment. So nucleation, this is sort of the take home message in a way for this talk, or for this lecture, is that nucleation offers a way for the system to avoid this uh, hump that it has to get over in free energy to start off the phase transition. Okay, so let's consider the surface of some impurity in the system, or more often it's actually the wall of the system itself. In our picture, the scenario we're working with is a balloon then the surface of that balloon at some microscopic length scales is a rough thing um, which will encourage the, the start of this phase transition, this, this nucleation process. Okay, so, so consider some rough surface. Um, or let's, let's put it this way. So let's ask the question, why does the phase transition in reality start at impurities Oops. impurities or uh, sort of rough boundaries of the system. So you can think of it as, empirically, this is known to be true, that phase transitions start at impurities. So if the cloud forms at the dust particles in the air, the cloud droplets form at the dust particles. Or if you do uh, a phase transition experiment in a system with solid boundaries, like this water balloon example we're talking about, the phase transition will start at the boundaries. Why does that happen? So, so consider the boundary of one of these impurities. of the system or of the impurity. So you've got some rough surface here. So this is the rough surface of the system or the impurity. And what, what I'm going to argue to you is that the phase transition starts in these nooks and crannies of the, the system. So if you, uh, if you start the liquid to gas transition, so say this stuff here is the liquid forming, and out here is the gas. Why does it form in these little nooks and crannies is the question. And the basic answer is because um, when it forms in these nooks and crannies, it requires less of this surface, uh, the surface tension related free energy. Okay. So uh, to consider it as, as a, very, a very simplistic example, um, so a very simple example would be if one of these nooks and crannies is, is actually shaped like this with straight walls, then as, as the liquid starts to form in this particular nook, as it, as it increases its volume, it imposes no change in surface area. So as volume increases, the surface area is, is fixed. In, in this extreme example, where the boundaries of this, this nook are straight. In this other example, where it's more rough, the surface area does increase with volume, but not as steeply as one of as r squared. Okay, so that's the point here, right? This hump came from this term, which has a r squared dependency, and that r squared dependency came from how the surface area changes as the droplet size r increases. It increases like r squared. But if you're on the boundary of a system, 
it will no longer increase as fast as r squared. It will increase somehow slower. So if you're on the boundary of the system, uh, it might be, well, it could be fixed in this extreme case. So in that case, it would just kind of drop like that. Or it could be just a less extreme bump if it's some more complicated surface like this. But the bottom line is that if the surface area um, increases with volume in a way that's less steep than 1 over r squared, then it will always form at the boundary. The nucleation process will always start at the boundary. OK, so that's the main point of this talk.